Section 12 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 12. Melmoth the Wanderer, Part 1. By Charles Robert Maturin. Introduction to Melmoth the Wanderer Balzac likens the hero of one of his short stories to Moliere's Don Juan, Goethe's Faust, Byron's Manfred, Maturin's Melmoth, great allegorical figures drawn by the greatest men of genius in Europe. But what is Melmoth? Why is he classed as a great allegorical figure? exclaimed many a surprised reader. Few had perused, few know at this day, the terrible story of Melmoth the Wanderer, half man, half devil, who has bartered away his soul for the glory of power and knowledge, and, repenting of his bargain, tries again and again to persuade some desperate human to change places with him, penetrates to the refuge of misery, the death chamber, even the madhouse, seeking one in such utter agony as to accept his help, and take his curse, but ever fails. Why this extraordinary tale, told with wild and compelling sweep, has remained so deep in oblivion, appears immediately on a glance at the original. The author, Charles Robert Maturin, a needy, eccentric Irish clergyman of 1780 to 1824, could cause intense suspense and horror, could read keenly into human motives, could teach an awful moral lesson in the guise of fascinating fiction, but he could not stick to a long story with simplicity. His dozens of shifting scenes his fantastic coils of tales within tales, sadly perplexed the reader of Melmoth in the first version. It is hoped, however, that the present selection, by its directness and the clearness of the story thread, may please the modern reader better than the involved original, and bring before a wider public some of the most gripping descriptions ever penned in English. In volume four of these stories comes a tale, Melmoth Reconciled, which Balzac himself wrote, while under the spell of Maturin's great allegorical figure. Here the unhappy being succeeds in his purpose. The story takes place in mocking, careless Paris, that branch establishment of hell. A cashier, on the eve of embezzlement and detection, cynically accedes to Melmoth's terms and accepts his help, with what unlooked-for results the reader may see. Charles Robert Maturin, Melmoth the Wanderer John Melmoth, student at Trinity College, Dublin, having journeyed to County Wicklow for attendance at the deathbed of his miserly uncle, finds the old man, even in his last moments, tortured by avarice and by suspicion of all around him. He whispers to John, I want a glass of wine. It would keep me alive for some hours, but there is not one I can trust to get it for me. They'd steal a bottle and ruin me. John was greatly shocked. Sir, for God's sake, let me get a glass of wine for you. Do you know where? said the old man, with an expression in his face John could not understand. No, sir. You know I have been rather a stranger here, sir. Take this key, said old Melmoth, after a violent spasm. Take this key. There is wine in that closet. Madeira. I always told them there was nothing there, but they did not believe me or I should not have been robbed as I have been. At one time I said it was whiskey, and then I fared worse than ever, for they drank twice as much of it. John took the key from his uncle's hand. The dying man pressed it as he did so, and John, interpreting this as a mark of kindness, returned the pressure. He was undeceived by the whisper that followed. John, my lad, don't drink any of that wine while you are there. Good God, said John, indignantly throwing the key on the bed. Then, recollecting that the miserable being before him was no object of resentment, he gave the promise required, and entered the closet which no foot but that of old Melmoth had entered for nearly sixty years. He had some difficulty in finding out the wine, and indeed stayed long enough to justify his uncle's suspicions. But his mind was agitated and his hand unsteady. He could not but remark his uncle's extraordinary look, that had the ghastliness of fear superadded to that of death, as he gave him permission to enter his closet. He could not but see the looks of horror which the women exchanged as he approached it, 
and finally when he was in it his memory was malicious enough to suggest some faint traces of a story too horrible for imagination connected with it he remembered in one moment most distinctly that no one but his uncle had ever been known to enter it for many years before he quitted it he held up the dim light and looked around him with a mixture of terror and curiosity there was a great deal of decayed and useless lumber such as might be supposed to be heaped up to rot in a miser's closet but john's eyes were in a moment and as if by magic riveted on a portrait that hung on the wall and appeared even to his untaught eye far superior to the tribe of family pictures that are left to moulder on the walls of a family mansion it represented a man of middle age there was nothing remarkable in the costume or in the countenance but the eyes john felt were such as one feels they wish they had never seen and feels they can never forget had he been acquainted with the poetry of southey he might have often exclaimed in his after life only the eyes had life they gleamed with demon light thalaba from an impulse equally resistless and painful he approached the portrait held the candle toward it and could distinguish the words on the border of the painting john melmoth anno 1646 john was neither timid by nature nor nervous by constitution nor superstitious from habit yet he continued to gaze in stupid horror on this singular picture till aroused by his uncle's cough he hurried into his room the old man swallowed the wine he appeared a little revived it was long since he had tasted such cordial his heart appeared to expand to a momentary confidence john what did you see in that room nothing sir that's a lie everyone wants to cheat or to rob me sir i don't want to do either well what did you see that you you took notice of only a picture sir a picture sir the original is still alive john though under the impression of his recent feelings could not but look incredulous john whispered his uncle john they say i am dying of this and that and one says it is for want of nourishment and one says it is for want of medicine but john and his face looked hideously ghastly i am dying of a fright that man and he extended his meagre arm toward the closet as if he was pointing to a living being that man i have good reason to know is alive still how is that possible sir said john involuntarily the date on the picture is sixteen forty six you have seen it you have noticed it said his uncle well he rocked and nodded on his bolster for a moment then grasping john's hand with an unutterable look he exclaimed you will see him again he is alive then sinking back on his bolster he fell into a kind of sleep or stupor his eyes still open and fixed on john the house was now perfectly silent and john had time and space for reflection more thoughts came crowding on him than he wished to welcome but they would not be repulsed he thought of his uncle's habits and character turned the matter over and over again in his mind and he said to himself the last man on earth to be superstitious he never thought of anything but the price of stocks and the rate of exchange and my college expenses that hung heavier at his heart than all and such a man to die of a fright a ridiculous fright that a man living one hundred fifty years ago is alive still and yet he is dying john paused for facts will confute the most stubborn logician with all his hardness of mind and of heart he is dying of a fright I heard it in the kitchen, I have heard it from himself. He could not be deceived. If I had ever heard he was nervous or fanciful or superstitious, but a character so contrary to all these impressions, a man that, as poor Butler says in his Remains of the Antiquarian, would have sold Christ over again for the numerical piece of silver which Judas got for him. Such a man to die of fear, yet he is dying, said John glancing his fearful eye on the contracted nostril the glazed eye the drooping jaw the whole horrible apparatus of the facies hippocratica displayed and soon to cease its display old melmoth at this moment seemed to be in a deep stupor his eyes lost that little expression they had before and his hands that had convulsively been catching at the blankets let go their short and quivering grasp 
and lay extended on the bed like the claws of some bird that had died of hunger so meagre so yellow so spread john unaccustomed to the sight of death believed this to be only a sign that he was going to sleep and urged by an impulse for which he did not attempt to account to himself caught up the miserable light and once more ventured into the forbidden room the blue chamber of the dwelling this motion roused the dying man he sat bolt upright in his bed this john could not see for he was now in the closet but he heard the groan or rather the choked and gurgling rattle of the throat that announces the horrible conflict between muscular and mental convulsion he started turned away but as he turned away he thought he saw the eyes of the portrait on which his own was fixed move and hurried back to his uncle's bedside old melmoth died in the course of that night and died as he had lived in a kind of avaricious delirium john could not have imagined a scene so horrible as his last hours presented he cursed and blasphemed about three halfpence missing as he said some weeks before in an account of change with his groom about hay to a starved horse that he kept then he grasped john's hand and asked him to give him the sacrament if i send to the clergyman he will charge me something for it which i cannot pay i cannot they say i am rich look at this blanket but i would not mind that if i could save my soul and raving he added indeed doctor i am a very poor man i never troubled a clergyman before and all i want is that you will grant me two trifling requests very little matters in your way save my soul and whispering make interest to get me a parish coffin i have not enough left to bury me i always told everyone i was poor but the more i told them so the less they believed me john greatly shocked retired from the bedside and sat down in a distant corner of the room the women were again in the room which was very dark melmoth was silent from exhaustion and there was a death-like pause for some time at this moment john saw the door open and a figure appear in it who looked round the room and then quietly and deliberately retired but not before john had discovered in his face the living original of the portrait his first impulse was to utter an exclamation of terror but his breath felt stopped he was then rising to pursue the figure but a moment's reflection checked him what could be more absurd than to be alarmed or amazed at a resemblance between a living man and the portrait of a dead one the likeness was doubtless strong enough to strike him even in that darkened room but it was doubtless only a likeness and though it might be imposing enough to terrify an old man of gloomy and retired habits and with a broken constitution john resolved it should not produce the same effect on him but while he was applauding himself for this resolution the door opened and the figure appeared at it beckoning and nodding to him with a familiarity somewhat terrifying john now started up determined to pursue it but the pursuit was stopped by the weak but shrill cries of his uncle who was struggling at once with the agonies of death and his housekeeper the poor woman anxious for her master's reputation and her own was trying to put on him a clean shirt and nightcap and melmoth who had just sensation enough to perceive they were taking something from him continued exclaiming feebly they are robbing me robbing me in my last moments robbing a dying man john won't you assist me i shall die a beggar they are taking my last shirt i shall die a beggar and the miser died A few days after the funeral, the will was opened before proper witnesses, and John was found to be left sole heir to his uncle's property, which, though originally moderate, had by his grasping habits and parsimonious life become very considerable. As the attorney who read the will concluded, he added, There are some words here, at the corner of the parchment, which do not appear to be part of the will, as they are neither in the form of a codicil, nor is the signature of the testator affixed to them but to the best of my belief they are in the handwriting of the deceased as he spoke he showed the lines to melmoth who immediately recognized his uncle's hand that perpendicular and penurious hand that seemed determined to make the most of the very paper thriftily abridging every word and leaving scarce an atom of margin and read 
not without some emotion, the following words. I enjoin my nephew and heir, John Melmoth, to remove, destroy, or cause to be destroyed the portrait inscribed J. Melmoth, 1646, hanging in my closet. I also enjoin him to search for a manuscript, which I think he will find in the third and lowest left-hand drawer of the mahogany chest standing under that portrait. It is among some papers of no value, such as manuscript sermons, and pamphlets on the improvement of Ireland and such stuff. He will distinguish it by its being tied round with a black tape, and the paper being very moldy and discolored. He may read it if he will. I think he had better not. At all events, I adjure him, if there be any power in the adjuration of a dying man, to burn it. After reading this singular memorandum, the business of the meeting was again resumed and as old Melmoth's will was very clear and legally worded, all was soon settled, the party dispersed, and John Melmoth was left alone. He resolutely entered the closet, shut the door, and proceeded to search for the manuscript. It was soon found, for the directions of old Melmoth were forcibly written and strongly remembered. The manuscript, old, tattered, and discolored, was taken from the very drawer in which it was mentioned to be laid. Melmoth's hands felt as cold as those of his dead uncle when he drew the blotted pages from their nook. He sat down to read. There was a dead silence through the house. Melmoth looked wistfully at the candles, snuffed them, and still thought they looked dim. Perchance he thought they burned blue, but such thought he kept to himself. Certain it is, he often changed his posture, and would have changed his chair had there been more than one in the apartment. He sank for a few moments into a fit of gloomy abstraction, till the sound of the clock striking twelve made him start. It was the only sound he had heard for some hours, and the sounds produced by inanimate things, while all living beings around are as dead, have at such an hour an effect indescribably awful. John looked at his manuscript with some reluctance, opened it, paused over the first lines, and as the wind sighed round the desolate apartment, and the rain pattered with a mournful sound against the dismantled window, wished. What did he wish for? He wished the sound of the wind less dismal, and the dash of the rain less monotonous. He may be forgiven. It was past midnight, and there was not a human being awake but himself, within ten miles, when he began to read. The manuscript was discolored, obliterated, and mutilated beyond any that had ever before exercised the patience of a reader. Michaelis himself, scrutinizing into the pretended autograph of St. Mark at Venice, never had a harder time of it. Melmoth could make out only a sentence here and there. The writer, it appeared, was an Englishman of the name of Stanton, who had traveled abroad shortly after the Restoration. Traveling was not then attended with the facilities which modern improvement has introduced, and scholars and literati, the intelligent, the idle, and the curious, wandered over the continent for years, like Tom Corvat though they had the modesty, on their return, to entitle the result of their multiplied observations and labors as only crudities. Stanton, about the year 1676, was in Spain. He was, like most of the travelers of that age, a man of literature, intelligence, and curiosity, but ignorant of the language of the country, and fighting his way at times from convent to convent in quest of what was called hospitality, that is, obtaining board and lodging on the condition of holding a debate in Latin, on some point theological or metaphysical, with any monk who would become the champion of the strife. Now, as the theology was Catholic, and the metaphysics Aristotelian, Stanton sometimes wished himself at the miserable Posada, from whose filth and famine he had been fighting his escape. But though his reverend antagonists always denounced his creed, and comforted themselves, even in defeat, with the assurance that he must be damned, on the double score of his being heretic and an Englishman, they were obliged to confess that his Latin was good and his logic unanswerable, and he was allowed, in most cases, to sup and sleep in peace. This was not doomed to be his fate on the night of the 17th of August, 1677, when he found himself in the plains of Valencia, deserted by a cowardly guide who had been terrified by the sight of a cross erected as a memorial of a murder, had slipped off his mule unperceived, crossing himself every step he took on his retreat from the heretic and left Stanton amid the terrors of an approaching storm, and the dangers of an unknown country. The sublime and yet softened beauty of the scenery around had filled the soul of Stanton with delight, and he enjoyed that delight as Englishmen generally do, silently.
the magnificent remains of two dynasties that had passed away, the ruins of Roman palaces and of Moorish fortresses were around and above him. The dark and heavy thunderclouds that advanced slowly seemed like the shrouds of these specters of departed greatness. They approached, but did not overwhelm or conceal them, as if nature herself was for once awed by the power of man. And far below, the lovely valley of Valencia blushed and burned in all the glory of sunset, like a bride receiving the last glowing kiss of the bridegroom before the approach of night. Stanton gazed around. The difference between the architecture of the Roman and Moorish ruins struck him. Among the former are the remains of a theater, and something like a public place. The latter present only the remains of fortresses, embattled, castellated, and fortified from top to bottom, not a loophole for pleasure to get in by. The loopholes were only for arrows. All denoted military power and despotic subjugation a la trance. The contrast might have pleased a philosopher, as he might have indulged in the reflection, that though the ancient Greeks and Romans were savages, as Dr. Johnson says, all people who want a press must be, and he says truly, yet they were wonderful savages for their time, for they alone have left traces of their taste for pleasure in countries they conquered, in their superb theaters, temples, which were also dedicated to pleasure one way or another, and baths, while other conquering bands of savages never left anything behind them but traces of their rage for power. So thought Stanton, as he still saw strongly defined, though darkened by the darkening clouds, the huge skeleton of a Roman amphitheater, its arched and gigantic colonnades now admitting a gleam of light, and now commingling with the purple thundercloud, and now the solid and heavy mass of a Moorish fortress, no light playing between its impermeable walls, the image of power, dark, isolated, impenetrable. Stanton forgot his cowardly guide, his loneliness, his danger amid an approaching storm, and an inhospitable country, where his name and country would shut every door against him, and every peal of thunder would be supposed justified by the daring intrusion of a heretic in the dwelling of an old Christian, as the Spanish Catholics absurdly term themselves, to mark the distinction between them and the baptized Moors. All this was forgot in contemplating the glorious and awful scenery before him, light struggling with darkness, and darkness menacing a light still more terrible, and announcing its menace in the blue and livid mass of cloud that hovered like a destroying angel in the air, its arrows aimed, but their direction awfully indefinite. But he ceased to forget these local and petty dangers, as the sublimity of romance would term them, when he saw the first flash of the lightning, broad and red as the banners of an insulting army, whose mater is Volvictis, shatter to atoms the remains of a Roman tower. The rifted stones rolled down the hill and fell at the feet of Stanton. He stood appalled, and, awaiting his summons from the power in whose eye pyramids, palaces, and the worms whose toil has formed them, and the worms who toil out their existence under their shadow or their pressure, are perhaps all alike contemptible. He stood collected, and for a moment felt that defiance of danger which danger itself excites, and we love to encounter it as a physical enemy, to bid it do its worst, and feel that its worst will perhaps be ultimately its best for us. He stood and saw another flash dart its bright, brief, and malignant glance over the ruins of ancient power, and the luxuriance of recent fertility. Singular contrast, the relics of art forever decaying, the productions of nature forever renewed. Alas, for what purpose are they renewed, better than to mock at the perishable monuments which men try in vain to rival them by? The pyramids themselves must perish, but the grass that grows between their disjointed stones will be renewed from year to year. Stanton was thinking thus when all power of thought was suspended by seeing two persons bearing between them the body of a young and apparently very lovely girl who had been struck dead by the lightning. Stanton approached and heard the voices of the bearers repeating, there is none who will mourn for her. There is none who will mourn for her, said other voices, as two more bore in their arms the blasted and blackened figure of what had once been a man, comely and graceful. There is not one to mourn for her now. They were lovers, and he had been consumed by the flash that had destroyed her, while in the act of endeavoring to defend her. As they were about to remove the bodies, a person approached with a calmness of step and demeanor, as if he were alone unconscious of danger and incapable of fear, and after looking on them for some time, burst into a laugh so loud, wild, and protracted, that the peasants, starting with as much horror at the sound as that of the storm, hurried away, bearing the corpses with them. 
Even Stanton's fears were subdued by his astonishment, and, turning to the stranger, who remained standing on the same spot, he asked the reason of such an outrage on humanity. The stranger, slowly turning round, and disclosing a countenance which, here the manuscript was illegible for a few lines, said in English, a long hiatus followed here, and the next passage that was legible, though it proved to be a continuation of the narrative, was but a fragment. The terrors of the night rendered Stanton a sturdy and unappeasable applicant, and the shrill voice of the old woman repeating, No heretic, no English, mother of God protect us, avaunt Satan, combined with the clatter of the wooden casement, peculiar to the houses in Valencia, which she opened to discharge her volley of anathematization, and shut again as the lightning glanced through the aperture, were unable to repel his importunate request for admittance, in a night whose terrors ought to soften all the miserable petty local passions into one awful feeling of fear for the power who caused it, and compassion for those who were exposed to it. But Stanton felt there was something more than national bigotry in the exclamations of the old woman. There was a peculiar and personal horror of the English, and he was right. But this did not diminish the eagerness of his... The house was handsome and spacious, but the melancholy appearance of desertion. The benches were by the wall, but there were none to sit there. The tables were spread in what had been the hall, but it seemed as if none had gathered round them for many years. The clock struck audibly. There was no voice of mirth or of occupation to drown its sound. Time told his awful lesson to silence alone. The hearths were black with fuel long since consumed. The family portraits looked as if they were the only tenants of the mansion. They seemed to say, from their mouldering frames, There are none to gaze on us. And the echo of the steps of Stanton and his feeble guide was the only sound audible between the peals of thunder that rolled still awfully, but more distantly, every peal like the exhausted murmurs of a spent heart. As they passed on, a shriek was heard. Stanton paused, and fearful images of the dangers to which travelers on the continent are exposed in deserted and remote habitations came into his mind. "'Don't heed it,' said the old woman, lighting him on with a miserable lamp. "'It is only he.' The old woman, having now satisfied herself by ocular demonstration that her English guest, even if he was the devil, had neither hoof, horn, nor tail, that he could bear the sign of the cross without changing his form, and that when he spoke not a puff of sulphur came out of his mouth, began to take courage, and at length commenced her story, which, weary and comfortless as Stanton was. Every obstacle was now removed. Parents and relations at last gave up all opposition, and the young pair were united. Never was there a lovelier. They seemed like angels who had only anticipated by a few years their celestial and eternal union. The marriage was solemnized with much pomp, and a few days after, there was a feast in that very wainscoted chamber, which you paused to remark was so gloomy. It was, that night, hung with rich tapestry, representing the exploits of the Cid, particularly that of his burning a few Moors who refused to renounce their accursed religion. They were represented beautifully tortured, writhing and howling, and Mahomet, Mahomet, issuing out of their mouths, as they called on him in their burning agonies. You could almost hear them scream. At the upper end of the room, under a splendid estrade, over which was an image of the Blessed Virgin, sat Donna Isabella de Cardoza, mother to the bride, and near her Donna Inez, the bride, on rich almohadas. The bridegroom sat opposite to her, and though they never spoke to each other, their eyes, slowly raised but suddenly withdrawn, those eyes that blushed, told to each other the delicious secret of their happiness. Don Pedro de Cardoza, had assembled a large party in honor of his daughter's nuptials. Among them was an Englishman of the name of Melmoth, a traveler. No one knew who had brought him there. He sat silent like the rest, while the iced waters and the sugared wafers were presented to the company. The night was intensely hot, and the moon glowed like a sun over the ruins of Saguntum. The embroidered blinds flapped heavily, as if the wind made an effort to raise them in vain, and then desisted. Another defect in the manuscript occurred here, but it was soon supplied. The company were dispersed through the various alleys of the garden. The bridegroom and bride wandered through one where the delicious perfume of the orange trees mingled itself with that of the myrtles in blow. On their return to the hall, both of them asked, 
had the company heard the exquisite sounds that floated through the garden just before they quitted it no one had heard them they expressed their surprise the englishman had never quitted the hall it was said he smiled with a most particular and extraordinary expression as the remark was made his silence had been noted before but it was ascribed to his ignorance of the spanish language an ignorance that spaniards are not anxious either to expose or remove by speaking to a stranger the subject of the music was not again reverted to till the guests were seated at supper when donna inez and her young husband exchanging a smile of delighted surprise exclaimed they heard the same delicious sounds floating round them the guests listened but no one else could hear it everyone felt there was something extraordinary in this hush was uttered by every voice almost at the same moment a dead silence followed you would think from their intent looks that they listened with their very eyes this deep silence contrasted with the splendor of the feast and the light effused from torches held by the domestics produced a singular effect it seemed for some moments like an assembly of the dead the silence was interrupted though the cause of wonder had not ceased by the entrance of father olavita the confessor of donna isabella who had been called away previous to the feast to administer extreme unction to a dying man in the neighborhood he was a priest of uncommon sanctity beloved in the family and respected in the neighborhood where he had displayed uncommon taste and talents for exorcism in fact this was the good father's forte and he piqued himself on it accordingly the devil never fell into worse hands than father olavida's for when he was so contumacious as to resist latin even the first verses of the gospel of st john in greek which the good father never had recourse to but in cases of extreme stubbornness and difficulty here stanton recollected the english story of the boy of bilson and blushed even in spain for his countrymen then he always applied to the inquisition and if the devils were ever so obstinate before they were always seen to fly out of the possessed just as in the midst of their cries no doubt of blasphemy they were tied to the stake some held out even till the flames surrounded them but even the most stubborn must have been dislodged when the operation was over for the devil himself could no longer tenant a crisp and glutinous lump of cinders thus father olavida's fame spread far and wide and the cardoza family had made uncommon interest to procure him for a confessor and happily succeeded the ceremony he had just been performing had cast a shade over the good father's countenance but it dispersed as he mingled among the guests and was introduced to them room was soon made for him and he happened accidentally to be seated opposite the englishman as the wine was presented to him father olavida who as i observed was a man of singular sanctity prepared to utter a short internal prayer he hesitated trembled desisted and putting down the wine wiped the drops from his forehead with the sleeve of his habit donna isabella gave a sign to the domestic and other wine of a higher quality was offered to him his lips moved as if in the effort to pronounce a benediction on it and the company but the effort again failed and the change in his countenance was so extraordinary that it was perceived by all the guests he felt the sensation that his extraordinary appearance excited and attempted to remove it by again endeavoring to lift the cup to his lips so strong was the anxiety with which the company watched him that the only sound heard in that spacious and crowded hall was the rustling of his habit as he attempted to lift the cup to his lips once more in vain the guests sat in astonished silence father olavida alone remained standing but at that moment the englishman rose and appeared determined to fix olavida's regards by a gaze like that of fascination olavida rocked reeled grasped at the arm of a page and at last closing his eyes for a moment as if to escape the horrible fascination of that unearthly glare the englishman's eyes were observed by all the guests from the moment of its entrance to effuse a most fearful and preternatural lustre exclaimed who is among us who i cannot utter a blessing while he is here i cannot feel one where he treads the earth is parched where he breathes the air is fire where he feeds the food is poison where he turns his glance is lightning who is among us who repeated the priest in the agony of adjuration while his cowl fallen back his few thin hairs around the scalp instinct and alive with terrible emotion his outspread arms protruded from the sleeves of his habit and extended toward the awful stranger suggested the idea of an inspired being in the dreadful rapture of prophetic denunciation he stood still stood and the englishman stood calmly opposite him there was an agitated irregularity in the attitudes of those around them which contrasted strongly the fixed and stern postures of those two who remained gazing silently at each other 
Who knows him? exclaimed Olavida, starting apparently from a trance. Who knows him? Who brought him here? The guests severally disclaimed all knowledge of the Englishman, and asked each other in whispers, Who had brought him here? Father Olavida then pointed his arm to each in the company, and asked them individually, Do you know him? No. 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 Was uttered with vehement emphasis by every individual. But I know him, said Olavida, by these cold drops, and he wiped them off, by these convulsed joints, and he attempted to sign the cross, but could not. He raised his voice, and evidently speaking with increased difficulty, by this bread and wine, which the faithful receive as the body and blood of Christ, but which his presence converts into matter as viperous as the suicide foam of the dying Judas, by all these I know him, and command him to be gone. He is, he is and he bent forward as he spoke, and gazed on the Englishman with an expression which the mixture of rage, hatred, and fear rendered terrible. All the guests rose at these words. The whole company now presented two singular groups, that of the amazed guests all collected together, and repeating, Who? What is he? And that of the Englishman, who stood unmoved, and Olavida, who dropped dead in the attitude of pointing to him. The body was removed into another room and the departure of the Englishman was not noticed till the company returned to the hall. They sat late together, conversing on this extraordinary circumstance, and finally agreed to remain in the house, lest the evil spirit, for they believe the Englishman no better, should take certain liberties with a corpse by no means agreeable to a Catholic, particularly as he had manifestly died without the benefit of the last sacraments. Just as this laudable resolution was formed, they were roused by cries of horror and agony from the bridal chamber, where the young pair had retired. They hurried to the door, but the father was first. They burst it open, and found the bride a corpse in the arms of her husband. He never recovered his reason. The family deserted the mansion, rendered terrible by so many misfortunes. One apartment is still tenanted by the unhappy maniac. His were the cries you heard as you traversed the deserted rooms. He is, for the most part, silent during the day, but at midnight he always exclaims, in a voice frightfully piercing and hardly human, "'They are coming!' They are coming! And relapses into profound silence. The funeral of Father Olavida was attended by an extraordinary circumstance. He was interred in a neighboring convent, and the reputation of his sanctity, joined to the interest caused by his extraordinary death, collected vast numbers at the ceremony. His funeral sermon was preached by a monk of distinguished eloquence, appointed for the purpose. To render the effect of his discourse more powerful, the corpse, extended on a bier with its face uncovered, was placed in the aisle. The monk took his text from one of the prophets. Death has gone up into our palaces. He expatiated on mortality, whose approach, whether abrupt or lingering, is alike awful to man. He spoke of the vicissitudes of empires, with much eloquence and learning, but his audience were not observed to be much affected. He cited various passages from the lives of the saints, descriptive of the glories of martyrdom, and the heroism of those who had bled and blazed for Christ and his blessed mother. But they appeared still waiting for something to touch them more deeply. When he inveighed against the tyrants under whose bloody persecution those holy men suffered, his hearers were roused for a moment, for it is always easier to excite a passion than a moral feeling. But when he spoke of the dead and pointed with emphatic gesture to the corpse, as it lay before them cold and motionless, every eye was fixed and every ear became attentive. Even the lovers, who, under pretense of dipping their fingers into the holy water, were contriving to exchange amorous billets, forbore, for one moment, this interesting intercourse, to listen to the preacher. He dwelt with much energy on the virtues of the deceased, whom he declared to be a particular favorite of the Virgin, and, enumerating the various losses that would be caused by his departure to the community to which he belonged, to society, and to religion at large, he at last worked up himself to a vehement expostulation with the deity on the occasion. "'Why hast thou,' he exclaimed, "'why hast thou, O God, thus dealt with us? Why hast thou snatched from our sight this glorious saint, whose merits, if properly applied, doubtless would have been sufficient to atone for the apostasy of St. Peter, the opposition of St. Paul, previous to his conversion, and even the treachery of Judas himself? Why hast thou, O God, snatched him from us?' and a deep and hollow voice from among the congregation answered, Because he deserved his fate. The murmurs of approbation 
with which the congregation honored this apostrophe half drowned this extraordinary interruption and though there was some little commotion in the immediate vicinity of the speaker the rest of the audience continued to listen intently what proceeded the preacher pointing to the corpse what hath laid thee there servant of god pride ignorance and fear answered the same voice in accents still more thrilling the disturbance now became universal the preacher paused and a circle opening disclosed the figure of a monk belonging to the convent who stood among them after all the usual modes of admonition exhortation and discipline had been employed and the bishop of the diocese who under the report of these extraordinary circumstances had visited the convent in person to obtain some explanation from the contumacious monk in vain it was agreed in a chapter extraordinary to surrender him to the power of the inquisition he testified great horror when this determination was made known to him and offered to tell over and over again all that he could relate of the cause of father olavida's death his humiliation and repeated offers of confession came too late he was conveyed to the inquisition the proceedings of that tribunal are rarely disclosed but there is a secret report i cannot answer for its truth of what he said and suffered there on his first examination he said he would relate all he could he was told that was not enough he must relate all he knew why did you testify such horror at the funeral of father olavida everyone testified horror and grief at the death of that venerable ecclesiastic who died in the odor of sanctity had i done otherwise it might have been reckoned a proof of my guilt why did you interrupt the preacher with such extraordinary exclamations to this no answer why do you refuse to explain the meaning of those exclamations no answer look i beseech you brother at the cross that is suspended against this wall and the inquisitor pointed to the large black crucifix at the back of the chair where he sat one drop of the blood shed there can purify you from all the sin you have ever committed but all that blood combined with the intercession of the queen of heaven and the merits of all its martyrs nay even the absolution of the pope cannot deliver you from the curse of dying in unrepented sin what sin then have i committed the greatest of all possible sins you refuse answering the questions put to you at the tribunal of the most holy and merciful inquisition you will not tell us what you know concerning the death of father olavida i have told you that i believe he perished in consequence of his ignorance and presumption what proof can you produce of that he sought the knowledge of a secret withheld from man what was that the secret of discovering the presence or agency of the evil power do you possess that secret after much agitation on the part of the prisoner he said distinctly but very faintly my master forbids me to disclose it if your master were jesus christ he would not forbid you to obey the commands or answer the questions of the inquisition i am not sure of that there was a general outcry of horror at these words the examination then went on if you believed olavida to be guilty of any pursuits or studies condemned by our mother the church why did you not denounce him to the inquisition because i believed him not likely to be injured by such pursuits his mind was too weak he died in the struggle said the prisoner with great emphasis you believe then it requires strength of mind to keep those abominable secrets when examined as to their nature and tendency no i rather imagine strength of body we shall try that presently said an inquisitor giving a signal for the torture end of section twelve recording by matthew reese davenport iowa